Well, hello there and I hope you're well. For those of you who don't know, my name is Pastor Stephen Burney and here we are in Garage Sermons. Now you might be wondering why, but we do a lot of motorbike vlogs during the year for social media, which means I spend a lot of time out here working on the bikes. So I thought, well, why not do some sermons out here too? So we'll see how it goes. This is the very first one. But um, we're basically out here in our motorbike garage and um, you'll probably find that there might be just a few distractions. We've got a lot of birds chirping at the time. There's people who kind of walk past the house. We've also got two cats. David and Emily have got um, Bubbles. He's a really darky ginger one. And um, Nala, who's a, a lighter ginger, but they might pass behind me without me noticing. There's also two rabbits called Sophie and Sasha, and they're lion head rabbits. But um, one of them's the runt of the litter, so she just looks like a complete ball of fluff. So you might see these guys kind of wandering about, and I just hope that they're not too much of a distraction for you. So yeah, just recovering from surgery at the moment. It's uh, mid-February at the minute, and I suppose the end of the surgery recovery is maybe like mid-March or something like that. So I'm kind of stuck at home until that, you know, that time comes to see this a way forward, you know. So uh, I thought this would be a, a great way to sort of start the sermons as part of our online ministry. So for those of you who don't know, I've never really done a sermons as such. I've done teachings and prayer and vlogs and all that sort of stuff. But the sermon wise is a little bit different to teaching. And um, basically I'm going to share a garage sermon each week. And my sort of style of preaching is that I never use notes. I don't like rehearsing. I like everything to just you know, sort of come as it is. And this is just to make sure that I'm really led by God and that I speak from the heart. But, um, you know, I've probably preached the thousands of sermons now, you know, thousands of teachings and, and whatnot. So this is very new to me, which is very cool, though. It's very cool. But everything remains the same. Um, you know, I've always been taught and I've always practiced that God has to lay that message in your heart. You know, he's, he's the one that's got to do that. And um, sometimes that message comes during the week before the Sunday service or the, the event that you're holding. Sometimes it comes on that weekend. Sometimes it comes when you're praying sort of first thing that morning. Sometimes it comes during worship. <laughs> Other times it comes five minutes into your sermon. You know, you're sort of halfway through your introduction and you suddenly get the message of you know, what you're meant to share. But this, is, uh, this kind of thing only comes by experience, you know. And if you think that, wow, God must talk to you all the time, well, there's a, there's a difference between God impressing something upon your heart and you actually receiving like an answer. You know, and um, I'm waiting for answers to a lot of things. You know, I'm, I'm always petitioning God and always looking to God. So, you know, and, and sometimes I just wish it was that easy, you know, that you get this answer kind of straight away. Um, but it doesn't really tend to work that way. However, with sermons, he always comes through. He always gives you something. And the rule always is that you don't question it. You don't question it at all. You just go up and you preach it. So it was quite odd. Uh, you know, I really felt what would be the first garage sermon that I could actually do on this, this channel, you know? And I thought it might be something quite easy just to get started with. But I got the words, losing your ministry, lost your ministry. And I kept sort of getting that impression in my heart. Again, it's not like a clear voice. It's just in there. And really, it tends to be when you actually do the sermon that you actually figure out, wow, it was God that laid that on my heart, you know? Or afterwards when you see the results. And you think after the you should learn and you wouldn't be surprised, but... It's, it's surprising, it's, it's always really good doing it this way. And uh, I know other pastors use notes and stuff, but absolutely, this is, just, this is just my way of doing things, you know. So I hope, here comes the cart now, I hope the carts, the rabbits, the birds, the people walking past, the wind, any knocks, you know, it doesn't bother you. I'm so used to a nice quiet church room, you know, where I can see everybody's faces and it's a bit more controlled, you know, and stuff like that. But here I'm sort of out of control, there's nothing really I can do. Especially the seagulls, they're pretty loud. But yeah, so this was the, the message that I felt the Lord lay on my heart, was for those of you that have went through life as a Christian, and got your ministry, went into your ministry, and then lost it for whatever reason. And that's the subject we're going to talk about today. Yes, it's very windy today, you guys, and we've got a big ivy, so there's loads of birds nesting at the moment. It's windy, the trees are sort of rustling, you know, all, all those sort of bits and pieces. So I hope none of that's a distraction for you today. Because this is a very important subject. And um, this is the one I feel the Lord's laid in my heart to be the very first real garage sermon. You know, so here we go. But um, when I was eight years old, I was given a, a word that um, I was going to preach and teach in the body of Christ. That's what I, my, my sort of destiny was, if you sort of want to put it that way. 
and my teenage years I fell away from God. And in 2002, I came back to God. And that first year was crazy, it was just a bit mental, you know. But one evening we went out to listen to a, a, a guy who was visiting called John Paul Jackson. He's now departed. And he gave us a public prophecy that myself and Sharon would be called to the ministry. So this was back in 2002. Seven years kind of passed and there was a lot of training in that. There was also four years of uh, ulcerative colitis, two big operations and, and all that sort of stuff. But at the end of it, we were given the role of pastor of the youth and young adult group in our church. So between 2009, 2012, that's what we did. Between 2012 and 2016 and a half, I served as the assistant pastor of our local church. But, um, you know, now surgery's gone wrong and all sorts. I've been off work for now for 18 months. You know, I've been off for 18 full months. And this is me just recovering from this, this surgery. But you'll find out why it's so apparent that I've shared that story. Hopefully you get to know us a little more if you haven't seen our statement of faith or about us. But um, that's very important to this particular sermon. Now the years that are running up to that time when we got set forward to be the youth and young adult pastors, that was a hard seven years for me. It was very, very difficult, challenged on so many levels. But you know, when we got the youth, it was like the victory. You know, and I've tasted victory before, but this victory was just, after everything, was just absolutely unbelievable. We were given this amazing youth group, and uh, most of whom we knew, you know, the, some of them were sort of ex very experienced young Christians, you know, in the church, so I knew them very, very well. And, um, I mean, it was just awesome. We had, some of the guys could play guitar, and really great singers, could play the drums, so we could, we could actually have our own worship band. So what we did was, each Sunday night, we had our own Sunday night youth service, a proper church service, you know, um, to whichever way you sort of look at that, I'd maybe explain that another day, but we had our own church service. Um, during the week, we'd have uh, an outreach on Thursday night called a youth cafe, and uh, that's where the youth could bring their friends and, and do all that. We went to loads of events in a, you know, sort of around Scotland, you know, uh, camping and oh, I mean, just absolutely brilliant fun. Campfires on the beach, the whole sort of deal, you know. And uh, about every second weekend, we'd have all the kids um, here at the house, or the youth here at the house. And um, we had our uh, son Jamie, he was here, and um, Gemma, who used to live with us, one of the youth. And um, it just made sense, you know, that we could spend more time with the youth in that way. Just relax and having fun, sweeties, whatever. And be, being honest, a lot of the times, Charlie and I just went away upstairs and watched TV, you know, whether they watched a DVD or something like that, you know. But they were a huge part of our lives, you know. <coughs> and during that time, I suppose, the youth group really doubled, you know. And um, there was youth that gave their hearts to the Lord, some, some really very quickly. Others, you know, took a little time, you just had to sort of leave them to it and sort of make their own decisions. Um, you know, baptised, they started seeing visions, they started having dreams. And near the end, some of them were even speaking in tongues, which was just awesome for the age that they were, you know. And like I said, uh, you know, a lot of those, not a lot, some of those youth were, were very experienced by this point, you know, they were, they were really on their way. And it, it stands for me as, without doubt, the most enjoyable years of my life. I mean, you know, the victory in the beginning just kept going all the way through, you know being a youth and young adult pastor, you know. And I obviously, you know, pastored as part of the church as well. You know, I was, I was called to speak on Sundays and minister to the adults as well. You know, so the, you know, the, the job really was, it wasn't halfy, halfy, 70, 30 maybe, you know, and that's, that's sort of what you did. And it was, it was the most awesome years of our lives, followed by the worst two years of our lives. So like I said before, 2009 to 2012, that's when we passed our youth and young adults. And for most people that saw everything that happened in the two years after that was just a move from being a youth pastor to an assistant pastor in a church that was closer to home. Um, and this was a really good move for us because we just had Emily and we just found out um, Sharon was pregnant with David, you know, so people that were coming sort of close to their, close to their 40s, their lives were about to change quite a bit. So this was a, this was a sort of good move for us, but um, that's what most people saw. And I suppose that's still the truth. It's just it's just the way all things worked out. But because of the individuals involved, I'm just uh, I really have to ask that you trust me. That you know I really look to God to see if it was my fault or theirs. You have to find that out. And you know, I find out that I did everything right, and 
this wasn't what God wanted, but you know, this is the way things turned out. So again, I don't want to go into that. I, I, go away. I can't. I don't really want to go into that just for the sake of the people who were involved. They might never see this, but that's, that's you know. Um, but basically we were pretty much influenced to step down and step away, you know. Um, that, that was the, the feel, that's, that's kind of things that happened. And I think if I shared with you three examples of that, I'd completely convince you that we, we did do everything right. But for the uh, seven months after that, I wasn't sure if I'd done it all right, you know. And um, a lot of seeking God almost every day, trying to figure out, you know, did I do it all right? And if I did do it right, you know, why did this happen? I don't, I don't understand what, what actually happened. And um, I finally got a word from a, a national overseer, actually. And he came to me and he said to me that, look, it's not your fault. You know, I mean, he, that's all he said. He just kind of put his hand on my shoulder and said, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. And I was like, why? You know, it really impacted me. And I looked to God and I said, you know, I, I said, was that a word from you? And it was a word from him, you know. And um, that was all well and good. We were at a, we were at a picnic at the time at the, one of the safari parks. And when we got into the car and started getting everything together, I just started feeling so angry, you know. I started feeling so angry and resentful. And um, I looked to God and I said to him, you know, someone, what's the point in being right? What's the point in getting it all right? The outcome's still the same. There's nothing that I can do. You know, and this was equally hard because, you know, as a youth pastor, you can contact the, the teenagers and you can, you know, you know their mums and whatnot. But when you're not the youth pastor anymore, you can't just, you, you know, you just can't email the kids or text the kids or do anything like that. You, you just can't do it. So um, within hours, we'd lost this kind of extended family that we'd had for almost three years. All that hard work we'd put in, all that weekends away, all that money we spent, goodness me. And in some respects, it just felt like we'd done it for nothing. You know, it, it was just like we'd done it for nothing. But that wasn't true, you know. That, you know, the influence that we had, the influence that God had, you know, was always going to be something very special for those kids, you know. But um, when I look at the outcome of that, there was nothing that I could have done to change it. I tried everything that I possibly could. And um, and then the way I've always looked at it is that we lost our ministry. Yeah, so we, we had that sort of transition, you know, where we moved from being youth and young adult pastors to assistant pastors in our local church. And uh, a, a, a church more local to us. And, uh, you know, it was awesome. You know, we were pa I was pastoring adults who were you know, doing sermons, teachings, ministering, you know, just doing all the things that a, a pastor sort of meant to do. And... Um, and I think things look great on the surface, you know, they, they, they certainly were. But underneath, for me personally, every time I thought about the youth or thought about um, what we'd lost, it sent me into quite a depression at times. And there's times where I was in a, a real sort of rat of depression, real depression, you know, not, not the, you know, not the just feeling low, the, the real depression. And that's the way it was for quite some time. Um, times if you catch me in the wrong way, you know, it still kind of hurts a bit, you know. But um, we sort of, like I said, we went, you know, from having these amazing kids as part of our lives to not having them part of our lives just like that, you know, and that, and that was it. So, um, you know, and I always felt our life was kind of set out before us, you know, we went to, you know, in time we're going to have a children's home, we're going to look for a building, we're going to start fostering, adopting and, you know, moving forward with that. We prayed about it a lot, looked into it a lot. And when the youth ended, that ended, you know, that's, that's just what it was. And again, I go back to saying, well, God absolutely assured me that, you know, this wasn't his intention. It's not what he wanted. And um, <coughs> so just let me make it very clear who I'm talking to today when we come to this. It may well be that you lost a ministry or whatever because you were too inexperienced. Maybe you were set forward or made to believe you could cope with a job and, you know, and that sort of never worked out. And that can hurt within itself. Goodness me. Um, I'm talking about the ones where you did everything right. God assured you you did everything right. There was so much fruit that it couldn't have been anything else but God because, you know, you just don't have the time or the energy to make a lot of these things happen. But still, you did everything right and it still never, you know, it still never happened. And um, that's that's very hard, you know. And if you guys are listening to this just now, you know, I just, I just want to say I understand. I really do. So, um, you know, this is the very first cottage sermon. I'm, you know, I don't really 
understand it. But um, I think today, when you look at me, I suppose you can look at me and say, well, you know, it was worth it. Because here you are, again, using experiences that God's given you to help other people. And that's absolutely true. And that's what it should be true for yourself. But, you know, the, you need more than that. You need an answer. You need answers from God, you know. And um, I think one of the things I certainly learned when um, after that was just how God wasn't in control of everything as such. And, I, and, I'll, and I'll show you what I mean by that. I mean that, you know, God can't control people. He can't control people. I thought, he, I thought he did, you know, I thought that when we lost this, that we'd somehow regain it, that people would feel repentance and these things would happen. But no, n n none of that happened. And that sort of shook me a bit. It shook my confidence in God thinking, right, well, you're not in control of everything, you know? But the great thing about God is that, you know, these, these little battles that get lost, we always think of these failures as failures. Whereas God sees success and success as success. It's, it's all there to make us grow as Christians, you know. It does hurt, but it makes us grow as Christians, which is absolutely phenomenal. So we should never feel as though we failed. You know, you can't say that in a Christian life. You know, everything is used for good. All things work together for good, you know. And although little battles may appear to be lost, the war never will be. God's calling upon your life never will be. Even if you've had a gap of five or six years, it does not matter. The war for your life, it cannot be won by the enemy. It can only be won by God. And that's one of the great things that you really need to take on board today. You know, that's something I have to take on board. The other is to really forgive those people. You know, we are called to forgive under any circumstances. And when it's people that have hurt us directly, that's not easy. So don't even try. <laughs> you know. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing, you know, and that really tells you that, you know, if you want to come to that place of forgiveness and release so that you can move on, it comes through that forgiveness, and only God can help you do that, from the spirit within, to truly, truly forgive these individuals for what happened and what they did. And um, it is really true, the amount of preachers I've spoken to in the past, you know, and I've been, so I've grown up, they said, you know, the most heart they've ever received um, being a Christian or being a pastor has been from other Christians, you know? Whether the, the Christian's a, you know, a, a, an inexperienced one or, you know, it's maybe just going through a period where God's really working on them or whatnot, you know? And, um, yeah, that's, that's where most of it comes from. You know, with people who maybe don't believe and criticise you, you know, you, you don't, I don't worry about stuff like that because, you know, the, I, I just, I know that they don't understand. They don't understand what's happening. Sometimes I don't understand what's happening. So how, how on earth could they? But um, it's just a very true fact that a lot of heart can come through just Christians in themselves. <laughs> so it seems like I'm painting a very dull picture of church, but, you know, let me just preach the whole sermon here, you know. Um, I think everyone, there's no doubt about it, every, everyone has this idea of the way church should be. You know, this is the way it should be. It should be this and it should be that. And it's like, almost like a default setting, you know, and it's like that in myself. I, you know, there's times I think it should be like this or it should be like that, you know. But the plain fact is that when you study the scriptures in depth, when you have a great understanding of what the New Testament church was, you find out that church isn't what you think it actually is. You know, you, you really don't. When you look at these letters that Paul wrote, that the, the others wrote, Peter and so on, they weren't writing to churches who were well-adjusted and everything was, uh, you know, great and holy. They had major issues at times, you know. And of course, as today, um, you know, churches should learn from their mistakes, like the Corinthians and you know, the others. We should learn from that and, and, and change that, which is great. But guys, church is meant to be a challenging environment. That, that's what it's meant to be. And we know that because God's call in our lives, our very first call, is to know Jesus more as our Lord and Saviour, to have that personal relationship with Him. The second is to experience that resurrected life, you know, where you're, you're gaining in character, that you're, um, you know, you're moving forward in the gifts of the Spirit, that you're doing all the things that come with being a Christian, some of the awesome things, you know. And the third is to fellowship with Him in His sufferings. We find this in the book of Philippians. To fellowship with Him in His sufferings. His sufferings. You see how he puts it? His sufferings. 
fellowship with him in his sufferings. And this, you guys, is twofold. Um, for his church and for the ongoing work of the gospel out there. That's the sufferings that Christ still feels today. The church is his body. He's the head. And he suffers with us. And, um, of course, for the unbelieving, the people who don't necessarily believe in him, that's an ongoing suffering too, trying to win the lost. But this makes the Christian life and church very challenging indeed, because God wants us to grow, you know, and he'll have us grow through things that we never thought we could handle. We couldn't, have, couldn't even believed it, you know. And I know my example's quite extreme. You know, the, the whole month in hospital, two and a half weeks, I can't remember, five days in a breathing machine, almost died three times, you know. Th these things happen to people who are in those positions, you know, of, of pastor and whatnot, you know. And um, you learn as a pastor that you don't climb a ladder and you're not above people. You actually go lower. You go lower and lower and lower and you're there to serve. You know, God said to me that the very first time I preached, God said to me very clearly, very sternly, you speak kindly to my people. I'm very clear, and that's, that's what I'm doing today. This is why my preaching style is the way that it is today. Um, you know, because that's, that's the way I want to be. But God wants us to grow. He wants us to grow in the fruits of the Spirit. He wants us to grow in the gifts of the Spirit. He wants us to be overcomers, to find those places a huge victory. And what you find is that most of what you learn before you get to the victory is failure, is failing. Is failing, is failing, is failing. And we look at that as a human standpoint. And God never calls failure failure. He calls it exercise. He doesn't even call it a test. It's called exercise. And what happens with exercise is it's just like if you went to the gym every day of the week. Some days you'd have a good day in the gym, some days you'd have a bad day in the gym. You know, and, but still your muscles are being added to, your fitness levels are being added to. It's never wasted as such. Unless you do it all completely wrong. But it's never wasted as such. And neither is that testimony you have about losing your ministry. And if you sometimes feel like you're the only one, you're not the only one. There's a lot of Christians in this position, some who are pastors and national overseers, that might have went through this. You know? It's not hugely common, but it's certainly something to speak about. It's certainly something to take forward. So we can see that God cannot control people. And we can see that church can be a challenging environment and that God wants us to grow through the experiences that he gives us, the things that come along our way. You know, if, if I knew what was going to happen at the end of the youth, would I have still done it? It's questionable, but having went through the youth, I would never trade those years that are absolutely awesome, and, you know, we still miss the kids, or they're not kids now, they're all grown up and getting married and jobs, different cities and whatnot, you know, so, you know, it's awesome, it's awesome to see that. But um, it was going to happen nonetheless. You know, there's no other way it was going to happen. You know, this is the way that it was going to happen. And um, it hurt a great deal, like I said. Still does at times, you know. But guys, you know, we've got to forgive. You know, and we cannot do that within ourselves. Don't try to. We've got to forgive those people that hurt us in the past, you know. And we have to forgive those Christians that will hurt us in the future too. You know, sometimes Christians are having a bad day, bad season. Maybe they're being really exercised by the Lord. You know, maybe they're really going through some stuff, you know, and you've got to always be very aware of that, guard our heart. But we've got to forgive, you guys. We've got to forgive. Release these people in our, our forgiveness, because if we don't, you're going to be bound and not free. You need to be free from that so that you can move on. But what you need to know today, and this is the big part, this is my little high point in my very first garage sermon, is that it was not your fault. And you need to know that. You need to... Fully take that into your heart as a seed and let it grow so you can have that healing. It was not your fault. Yes, you did everything right, or as, as best as you can, any, any sort of Christian can do. You did it all right. You saw massive fruit. You got great words from God, and still you lost it. It's not easy. That's not easy. But the forgiveness. Forgive, forgive, forgive. The high point. Boy, you know, even just thinking about it just now, it's strange because I haven't, I haven't you know, spoken about this stuff for quite some time. It, it really does, it really does uh, hurt, you know, it, it really, really does hurt. That last little bit really caught me by surprise, I have to admit. Um, you know, it, it, it doesn't hurt the same, but you just sort of, you still feel that sort of 
prick in your heart. You know, it's 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 one of those things. But nothing like the the pain we experienced. You know, sort of originally. You know. But guys, you know, for our own spiritual health, you've got to let it go and um, ask the Lord to help you forgive them. You know, you can't forgive them yourself. You've got to, you know, have God make that happen, you know. Because you need to be released into that freedom of your next ministry, or the ministry, for what it could be. Where all those experiences that you've had as a Christian all begin to make sense. All of it begins to have purpose. And that part will just be a memory that you'll share to help other people but for now guys church is a challenging environment and the greater the church the more of a challenge you know and uh, it is tremendous it can hurt at times but we've got to grow as Christians and we've got to grow not only in the hard times but in the great times as well and God really blesses you so much for so long you know that you're just like absolutely blown away you know but we've got to let it go and you've got to take it into your heart that it wasn't your fault it really wasn't your fault so that's quite an odd subject to start with our very first um, garage sermon you know the the teaching which we'll be um, putting online on Tuesdays is teaching you know doctrinal teaching and um, it's always quite easy because you're doing little series and you know I know what all those different parts are you know but with preaching and teaching each week I don't know what next week's message is going to be. I don't know why this week's message has been what it is, but it doesn't matter. It's got to be God. Or I'm not going to sit here and do it, you know? So listen, guys, thank you so much for listening to this. Thank you so much for watching this. Uh, just thank you so much. I just hope that none of the background noises or anything else has uh, distracted you during this time, you know? But um, many more garage sermons to come. So God bless you and thank you so much.